All right, we're good. <clears throat> Research talk, noon. If you're available, come check it out. All right, so uh, we're going to finish up this lecture, move to the other GI tract nematodes, the non hookworms. Uh, do you have, I know we should be finishing this up today, so I've got two quizzes getting released. I put their due dates on Monday after spring break. I hope. I think I did. I hope I didn't screw up and put Monday of spring break. It's not Monday of spring break, it's the Monday after, but again, can't. I hope I did it correctly. If I didn't, you'll, you'll know it. Somebody will email me and just know it's That'll give you enjoy spring break. Should review some life cycles, maybe a little bit. Um, but when you get back then, you can kind of just get back into the routine. All right, so this is where we left off. Pathology of hookworm, right? It's really caused by mechanical damage and then the hemorrhaging that, that might happen. All right, uh, and we said that there's going to be a difference in the blood loss because they're going to feed. They, they feed at different amounts. Uh, but what you could do, but what ends up generally happening is that you develop this iron deficiency anemia. So the blood that gets uh, consumed, some of the iron gets released, we reabsorb it, but it's still not going to be enough to counter the blood loss and the damage. So just remember this iron deficiency anemia and the decrease in, pl in plasma proteins uh, as we talk about our pathology. So symptoms, we're going to break it down into a moderate infection and a heavy infection. So a moderate infection uh, is one where you don't have a huge number of worms. And we'll talk about the difference in, in the species, uh, I think, next slide. But if you have a moderate infection, which you generally exhibit a slight intermittent abdominal pain, uh, often have loss of normal appetite because you've got some GI distress, so you're not normally hungry, and then also geophagy. I think we asked, what's geophagy? Eating dirt. Dirt pies? It's a real thing. It's a real thing in areas where hookworms are a problem. They'll cook up, take some dirt, make a casserole out of it. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? For what? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They don't have enough iron in their diet. So for some reason, you've got this desire to, to start eating dirt as a way to increase your iron. Tech, the lab tech, at uh, where I did my postdoc. Uh, yeah, she says her, her grandmother makes this dirt casserole, which is basically dirt, and they've got a specific spot where she will collect it because apparently that was the good that was the good dirt. But it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Heavy infection, you get much more severe cases. So severe protein deficiency. All right. That's going to lead to a slew of, of symptoms, including dry skin and hair, all right? edema, swelling, uh, pot belly in children. So, you know, we talked about a little bit of pot belly and I, uh, with schistosoma, so like ascites, which was fluid buildup. We're, we're looking at pot belly, which isn't fluid buildup, but it's more of, hey, the, you're, you're so. You know, there's so much inflammation going on that swells, it swells the belly out. Delayed puberty. You need a lot of protein. You need proteins to per per proceed, to start to, re to mature reproductively. Mental dullness, same thing. You need proteins to develop your brain. All right? So all of these things, the delayed puberty, mental dullness, all tends to be characteristic of, or historically of how some of, the, some of these individuals in the hookworm areas would be portrayed in literature and art uh, and uh, visual arts, the performances and stuff. Then you also have possible heart failure and death. Uh, that's, it, your body just can't take it anymore. Just can't take it anymore. Correct. 
person. Ready? All right. So the disease versus infection. All right, so you can be infected and not really exhibit the disease. So there's a lot of people who do have hookworm, but they don't exhibit any of those, those signs, any of those characteristics. It's like they don't even know they have a parasite with them. So the presentation of the disease really depends on a few different things. One of them is just the, the number of worms. If you have a dozen worms, there's probably going to be little to no damage that you notice, little to no symptoms that were ever ex exhibited. The more worms you have, the more likely you are to start exhibiting these, these symptoms, exhibiting the GI distress, the protein deficiencies, the iron anemia, and so forth. Species of hookworm also plays a role, and it's tied to, well, I won't tell you why. We'll ask that at some, at some question. So, Nicator, in order to produce these severe symptoms, you need anywhere from 500 to 1,000 worms in your GI tract. But for Ancelosma, it's only about 100. The question is why? Yeah, I almost slipped up and gave you that why. Why is that? Why the difference in these worms? Ancelosma eats more. Ancelosma eats worm more. Per worm, they eat more blood. So if you kind of figure out your blood loss, yeah, at these quantities of worms, you're, you're having about the same amount of blood loss, which generates those severe symptoms. So you need more Nicator to get to the same level of symptoms. And the last bit is nutritional, con nutritional condition of the host. And I know I've mentioned this in our terminology side, at the very start, when we, when we were defining a parasite, right? We said sometimes you'll have a parasite and you don't show any sort of evidence of harm. Um, so does that necessarily make it a parasite? And we said, yeah, it still, still causes harm because it's taking energy away from the host. Well, if you have an abundance of energy, you can fight that worm. The worm can steal stuff from you and you're not going to notice it. But if you are malnourished, if you are malnourished, you don't have that extra energy available. So for individuals that are malnourished or lack nutrition, you're more likely to exhibit severe, severe symptoms with fewer worms overall. All right. And this usually holds true with most of, of our intestinal parasites. You ready? Oops. All right. Canine hookworm. That's Ancelostoma caninum. So we do have some slides down in the lab. We talked about human versus canine and the different routes of infection. Well, with Ancelosma caninum, they can penetrate the gut or the skin or the oral mucosa. Or if an infective J3 is swallowed, then that J3 just remains in the gut uh, without undergoing migration and just starts developing to the adult. So Ancelosma caninum can do this. All right. We're not going to really talk about any of the pathology associated with with the dog itself. Instead, what happens if humans accidentally get infected by this worm? In this case, it causes something called creeping eruptions. All right, so Ancelosma caninum is most likely the cause of creeping eruptions. What is that? Well, the alternative name is cutaneous larva migraine. This is describing a situation where the larval stage penetrates into the skin and then migrates, but doesn't, can't ever find its way to where it needs to go. So it just wanders aimlessly in the skin. All right. So this is, a, you know, 
We're going to say it's caused by non-human hookworms. There are some other parasites that might also exhibit this, and it has the same general name, uh, cutaneous larva migrans. It has that same general name. But for us, for this class, we're going to creeping eruptions. This will be a canine hookworm that infects humans, or tries to infect humans. All right, so the question is, why does it aimlessly wander in the epidermis? It wanders around here because it can't penetrate through the basement membrane of our skin. So if it can't penetrate through the basement membrane, then it can't reach the blood or lymphatic system. So it just sits there in the skin, moving around, burrowing through cells, which will start to produce inflammation. So it's inflammatory response against the damage that's being caused and waste products of the worm, and any bacteria that comes in on the cuticle of that worm. With this inflammatory response, what you get is a red itchy wound that could potentially become uh, infected with that pyogenic bacteria, so the pus-forming bacteria. So the creeping eruptions is you can almost trace where these guys are going because you're having this red inflammation that develops. That's our creeping eruptions. This will last about a week, maybe longer, could last up to months. But what, what, what's happening is our immune system doesn't kill it. So it's going to wander around until it dies, runs out of energy and dies. Or we apply a topical drug, so like a cream, anti-parasite cream, Right to the surface, that'll penetrate. It doesn't have to penetrate far. It gets down into the epidermis, reaches the worm, causes them to die. Easily treated, but you have to recognize it. You have to remove them. Nope. You? They are small. These J3s are tiny. They're tiny. They are not a worm that we have to remove, but we will talk about one. Well, like what happens to them in the body? When they die, so now once they die, then they'll start to break down. You'll, you'll have your encapsulation, slow, slow breakdown of the cuticle, and they'll clear them out. Your immune system will clear it out. All right. I'll leave that up there for now as I open up our next presentation. Any final questions for hookworms? I could handle a hookworm. That's, I mean, I don't think it would be too traumatic to know that I had a hookworm. Treat it, clear it out, that's good. What's the parasite you'd least likely want to have? We'll talk about it. All right, ready? All right, so that finishes up our hookworms. That's their quiz. We've got uh, just a general information quiz. And then I have the life cycle, and I did the same thing. Three attempts. Uh, just the first one needs to be done by the due date. Uh, you can use, you can save the, the other two attempts uh, to get, you know, before, I think the Wednesday before our, our next exam, which is currently scheduled for the Friday of after spring break. That's when we're currently scheduled. So we'll see we'll see if we keep that or if we move it to, to the following Friday. All right. Next up are the GI tract residents that are not hookworms. Right, the non-hookworm GI tract residents. That's going to include three species that we'll talk about. Um, Ascaris, pinworm, and camelanus. We're going to start with that Ascaris. So we're in the same class, class Chromodoria. We're in the family Ascaridae, or Ascaridae. I guess you could say it again. Pronunciation, where's our... Seems like our non-native English speakers have a better pronunciation because they they actually learn like where to apply emphasis based on the letters, which I know there's exceptions, but I don't ever remember talking about that in grade school. 
All right. So members of this family exhibit oral transmission. So you will accidentally consume the infective stage. But these stages have to undergo some sort of migration through the tissue. So like hookworms, they penetrate your skin, they penetrate the gut mucosa, they do the migration to get to the GI tract. In this group, they start in the GI tract and they can't develop until they get out of the GI tract and undergo this tissue migration just to get back to the GI tract, which is just strange if you ask me. But there has to be a reason there. There must have been some benefit to it. So morphologically, members of this group are generally large and stout worms. This is from the website, uh, and I'm sure you've seen Ascaris in zoology. Eight inches, 12 inches, up to like a centimeter wide. They're thick, they're muscular. All right, these guys possess three prominent lips. So you've got your obvious triradiate symmetry. These guys lack a pharyngeal bulb, but they could have something called a ventriculus, which is kind of like a stomach, kind of like it's a stomach. So you have your transition from the esophagus to this other structure called the ventriculus and then into the intestines. So it does have a slightly different, different appearance underneath the scope. We don't see it because we're only looking at the cross section of Asperger. All right, these worms can also have digestive or absorptive seeky, which is basically a situation where you have this must be an energy pyramid and triangle, square, circles, squid games. So, All right, so. They are ventriculous and really muscular. And then what you could have are these seeky that extend either forward or back. So you've got these, they have a couple different names uh, depending on if they're going forward or backwards, all right? But they're thought to increase absorptive area that food can go in there, continue to digest and, and, and absorb. Uh, in some cases, you have both. Other cases, you just have one. So that's, these things are fairly early on in the taxonomic keys when you're trying to identify these worms. Do they have you know, uh, intestinal tiki? Do they have a uh, pyloric tiki? Things like that. Or uh, intestinal or, um, I guess, pyloric tiki. That's what it is. The example is Ascaris. That's what we're going to talk about. Ascaris has a long history with, uh, with humans. It's been men mentioned in the Ebers papyrus. So we knew ancient, ancient Egyptians had this worm. We've got two species, Ascaris sum and Ascaris lumbricoides. Ascaris sum is in pigs, Ascaris lumbricoides is in humans, but I will tell you the only difference that we have is that there are tiny denticles or dentigerous ridges along the inner edge of the lips and you could basically only see that with scanning electron microscopy. So I would say if, if this is what separates the species, then maybe they're still the same species. And there is questions on um, whether or not Ascrasum could also infect humans or if Lubricoides could also infect pigs. So it's kind of they separated it because it looked like you couldn't have that, that, that uh, crossover infection. So they start looking at that, which is probably true. We probably have these two different species. You ready? The life cycle, fortunately, is the same for both. So the difference will be the host. You know, what host based on the species. So let's go through the life cycle. or soon, we'll just say Ascaris. Just do Ascaris because that same general pattern. So our adults are in the small intestine. That's where they live. Okay. 
have an asterisk there. We'll talk about that. The asterisk, or the adult small intestine, eggs get out with the feces. Egg gets out with the feces, and then once it gets out, you have your J1 develop inside the egg, bolts to the J2, and then, oops, we have a dashed line there with a question mark on the bolt, because there is some disagreement on whether or not we get to the J3 inside the egg or at some other time in our life cycle. But we definitely have to get to J2. That's a minimum. All right? So this egg is very resistant. I know I need to open this up. Expand it. The egg is very resistant. It's got all four layers on it. So when we talked about the eggs, we had that fourth layer that was kind of optional. This one has it, and this is why they're so resistant. They are resistant to uh, common disinfectants. Right? They're going to survive. They're resistant to desiccation, which, a lot of it, which means these eggs are going to persist out in the environment for a long time. And they kind of need to do that because you're relying on our host to accidentally consume an egg. And if, it, if the egg comes out in the feces, what hosts are actually going to feed on fecal pot? Probably not, not many. All right, so they're going to be out in the environment until they get distributed someplace else. Now, as part of that, it takes about nine days, nine days to two weeks for the J1 to actually develop inside of that egg. So you know, this isn't, they don't come out and they're immediately infected. It's going to take some time. All right, so we accidentally ingest the egg. So this was our environment. That's our definitive host. So pig or human, depending on the species. So now we have either a J2 or a J3 in the intestine. don't know which one it is, that J2 or J3 leaves the intestine and gets into the blood or lymphatic system. It utilizes the system to get to the heart. we now are getting into the circulatory system. So if we're already in the blood or the circulatory system, we just stay in the circulatory system. But with the lymphatic system, we have to get to the circulatory system because we have to go to the heart. The heart then pumps us over to the lungs. Where, just like our hookworms, they burst out in the alveolar spaces. All right, still as a J2 or J3. So we're basically the same thing as hookworm, undergoing the same tissue migration. All right, now, here's where it's interesting. If we're a J2, then we have to undergo a molt to get to the J3 stage. And then we have to go another molt to get to the J4 stage. If that worm is actually a J3, then it'll just molt directly to that J4. 
Again, it's unsure what are, which, which one it is. But during this time, we are migrating to the glottis. We're migrating to the glottis. And then, once we get up to the glottis, cough and swallow. J4 now is back in our intestine, where it finishes development by molting to get to our adult. This migration, once we burst out in the alveolar spaces, it takes about 10 days to get to the glottis. And then we mature as adults. And eggs start being produced in about 60 to 65 days post-infection, if they can find a mate quickly. Important part of this life cycle is this development inside the lungs. We have to get to the J4 stage before we get coughed and swallowed and pass back through the stomach. Because if we don't, the worm's going to die. The J2 cuticle, the J3 cuticle, they cannot survive the stomach acid. The J4 cuticle can. So if this happens to move quickly, it's the J3, and then we cough and swallow, those are all lost. So this stage is actually very important in the life cycle of the worm. This has to happen. We have to get to that J4 in order for our life cycle to develop. So what does that mean for our life cycle and its path? Well, it means we have actually two stages that move through the stomach. The eggs, they go through the stomach. Their four layers help protect it from the stomach acid. And then our J4 also has to pass through the stomach to get to that final site of infection. Questions? Not terrible? Yep. Are we going to talk about, um, was that the part about the small intestine? Mm -hmm. Why have you You can make a note and say, See pathology. It's also why this is the worst one in my mind. I mean, there's other parasites that will cause death. Those are obviously bad. You don't want that. But of the ones that don't really cause death, don't give me this. Don't give me this one. All right. So I did add. Additional points for that life cycle. So I think, yeah, so you see the life cycle and then the A and B, that was all kind of to add it. the additional information uh, that I try to talk through on the life cycle so you know, we can clarify it. So again, there's some dispute between uh, the J2 or J3 being inside the egg. So the infective stage itself is the egg, but the egg has to have J2 or J3, whichever. Whichever side you take, and I think both sides are, are uh, both both sides are, are valid. It's hard to just to tell between the J two and J three. It doesn't matter which one it is. We still have to get to the J four before traveling back through the stomach. So on these slides, here's our eggs, and you can see we've got this thick coat, and actually with Ascaris, it looks bumpy, and that, that's characteristic. Bayless Ascaris also has that. So we had. Bayless ascaris uh, as a presentation, or Bayless ascaris, depends on how you pronounce it. Uh, they all they, they have something like this, but it's very characteristic. These things are resistant. And then also on the side, I give you some uh, cross sections. So here's a cross section up at the anterior end. This is our muscular esophagus, and you can see the triradiate symmetry. Uh, don't know if any of our slides have this, uh, but we do have cross-section of both male and female. So that's what we have in our lab. Uh, and it's good because you can see the structures uh, of our 
uh, that is typical of, that are typical of nematodes. All right, ready? All right, so our pathology is going to be broken down into three different phases, just like hookworm. Um, so you have your migration. Uh, same thing with the hookworm. Same types of pathology. Those wandering juveniles could cause localized inflammatory responses. Just kind of depends on where they go. Uh, usually, I'm going to say the chance that they go someplace other than the lungs is going to be small, but you do have that possibility, we, and that's why we present it. You can see it. All right, so they get lost. They might like burrow into muscle tissue, causing an inflammation and so forth. The lung stage has basically the same type of pathology as hookworms because you're bursting out into those alveolar spaces, and when you burst out, you're causing a small, small hemorrhage, small drop of blood from forming. So on this... They actually have a name for it. It's Ascaris pneumonitis. All right, so it's basically pneumonia, inflammation caused by Ascaris. Uh, this usually happens with heavy infections when all of our migrating juveniles emerge simultaneously or within a very short period of time. So you can have that small, small pools of blood initiating uh, edema, so fluid buildup in that area, and that could clog the uh, air spaces, the alveolar spaces. That's going to hinder uh, respiration, so cause some breathing problems, low oxygen levels, and, and so forth. But you also have accumulation of white blood cells and dead epithelium uh, that can get in there, further clogging the spaces and, and disrupting gas exchange. So very similar to what hookworms would cause. The intestinal stage is different. We ready? Usually, there's no big deal. The adults feed on the contents of the lungs. Or of the lungs, contents of the, of the intestine. They're not causing mechanical damage, or they're not feeding on blood or anything. They're just feeding on your, your, your food that, you, that your diet's digesting. All right. Uh, could, be, could contribute to malnutrition, so if you're, you don't really get enough food to begin with, it could take some of the nutrients away from you, leading to more malnutrition. Uh, and in some cases, it's the waste product in the worms itself could generate an, an allergic reaction uh, that, you know, you would recognize as kind of like severe allergies. It's the heavy infections, though, that really can cause some of the, the what I call the scary and, and the freaky type of symptoms. All right, so in heavy infection, these are big, stout worms, you could generate intestinal blockage which means there's so many worms in there that they block the food from passing through the gut. And it just becomes stagnant there. And that's a bad thing. All right? It's a bad thing. You've got a lot of bacteria. The bacteria themselves are producing a lot of gas. You can't do that. You're going to have swelling, discomfort, and you're going to need to go in and have surgery to remove this blockage. Here's one. Uh, I... Don't, this wasn't a human. I think this was a dog. Intestinal blockage. That's how many worms were in that intestine. Massive. The other thing is that because you're taking up all the space and because Ascaris wants to be in the small intestine, they get forced out of that area. And that can lead to wandering adults. Adults that are looking for a different space. It could be due to overcrowding, but usually this is a female worm that's trying to find a mate. So even though I have it under heavy infections, if you only had, get infected with one or two worms and they just both happen to fe be females, they're going to wander. They're going to look for a mate. And that wandering is when we can start getting some more of these, these pathologies. Symptoms. Blockage of the appendix or bile or pancreatic ducts. 
they're traveling up. These ducts open into your intestine. They say, oh, here's a spot. Let me check out, see if, if, I'm, if I can find my mate in here. They get in there, but those ducts are pretty small. So then they get stuck. And if they get stuck, what, do you, what has to happen? You're going to have to go in and have surgery. You're going to have to get it out. Sometimes they can make it up into the bile duct and then start to go apply pressure into the liver and start causing abscesses, necrosis in parts of the liver. All right, and that's, again, you, you'll have symptoms, you'll go to the doctor, and it's really going to have to be some images. Sometimes with the blood, uh, blood panels, they'll, they'll have an idea based on what types of white blood cells you have. Maybe give some indication, but yeah, they're, they're going to have to see. Is there a worm in there? Sometimes a worm ends up, start traveling back up. So they get into the stomach, and now they're in the stomach. Does our stomach digest them? No. The J4 cuticle and the adult cuticle is basically unharmed by stomach acids, but those worms are still in there moving around and wiggling around. That's going to cause some nausea. <laughs> and... To make it worse, the acidity actually aggravates the worm, making them move around. So here's this worm in your stomach moving around. You're like, I'm not feeling good. I'm not feeling good. Maybe it was a, you know, the leftover food that you ate. Or it could be asterisk. Sometimes it continues crawling out. And maybe it gets up there and goes back down and hits the windpipe, comes back down the trachea, causing suffocation. And that exit is really what I imagine as being one of the worst possible things to happen. Is I get up in the morning, I'm shaving, and all of a sudden I'm not feeling good. I'm like, I start coughing, and here's this worm wiggling out of my nose or my mouth. I just, I, I just have a, I'm sorry, that's like massive horror movies. It's, you have nightmares dreaming of this stuff. But coming up that way isn't the only way could also be going the wrong direction. So there are reports where people find worms wiggling around in their underwear, and they've left, they've exited. Usually, again, it's a, it's a wandering female that happens. So, yeah, and it was funny. I, I say it's funny because, um, geez, 2014 maybe? Uh, while we were... Talking about this, I mean, within days, somebody from New York posted and said, hey, I just had a farmer came and found these in his underwear. <laughs> Thought y'all would, would, would like it. So I opened up the picture and we saw it. And sure enough, a couple, a couple of aspirins. Again, that, I have a tapeworm. Fine. I, I'll take some drugs and it'll pass. But God, I can't imagine these things leaving. It's terrifying. That, that leads to psychosis. That's what it is. All right. So that's not, I mean, again, there's parasites that you really don't want to get. And I know I don't want to get them because they can lead to death. Asterisk, not so much. It's more of that visualization. So. All right. So we are moving to a different family, the oxy, oxyuridae. These are pinworms. There's a lot of pinworms out there. We're going to restrict our talk to human pinworms. All right, our females typically have a slender and sharp pointed tails. We have a slide that's not that great, but you can actually see the overall shape. And you can see this long, slender pointed tail. Most of the members of, of pinworms live in the posterior part of the gut, so large intestine and lower. But we have some pinworms that'll live in the lungs and, and so forth. We're restricting it to human, human pinworms. These are the only known endoparasites with haplodiploidy. Haplodiploidy, which means our males are haploids, our females are diploids. So our haploid males develop parthenogenically. So you have unfertilized eggs, they'll develop as a male, you get a fertilized eggs, develop into a female. The species we're going to talk about, this human pinworm, is called Enterobius vermicularis. 
It's also called the uh, seat worm. Why do you think it call, it's called the seat worm? Does it come out of your bum? That's it. Uh, that is 100% right. It comes out of your bum. Seat worm. Usually in, in, in the U.S., and, and again, we're fortunate to be in the U.S. that we don't really have parasite problems. We've our, Not just our hygiene, but also uh, sanitary conditions. Um, you know, a lot of our behaviors have really treated and eliminated a lot of these parasites from America, but they're still here. So pinworms are here. The people most likely to get pinworms are going to be kids at daycares that would then transfer it to their family members. All right? So pinworm, seat worm. This is Enterobius vermicularis. Features of it. Very prominent pharyngeal bulb. It's a black and white image. I believe I, I scanned it from the textbook. You can see very prominent esophagus. Bulb. Here's our esophagus, muscular esophagus. All right. And the other thing is it possesses cephalic alley. So you can make out, you've got these alley here, these wing type structures. Uh, sometimes we could see them in our specimens, sometimes we can't. Again, it just kind of depends on which orientation because they're kind of on the side of them. And we need our worm to be in this orientation so we could see the wings on both sides. More than likely, most of our worms are on the side so we can't identify them. We can't see those alley. All right. So the epidemiology is a little bit atypical. So a lot of our parasites tend to be restricted to the tropical and subtropical regions. This one's not so much. This one uh, is basically not, not really limited by moist and warm conditions. It can happen globally. Moreover, it's not limited to the poorer socioeconomic classes. So when we think of parasites, we're really thinking about those populations most susceptible are the very low, the very poor, the lower <coughs> socioeconomic classes, uh, or those countries, poor classes too. Now, with the countries, of course, you get the, you know, I'm going to say the warlords, or you know, the very rich that are very well off, while the vast majority of the citizens are living in, in extreme poverty. Those in extreme poverty have the parasites, the other ones likely do not. So I think we are getting to the life cycle. Um, so I think kind of right now what we're going to probably do is stop here and then we're going to be moving the exam. Um, and I think if we move the exam, it won't, it won't be that Friday. And I'll tell you that Friday when we get, when we get back, we, I won't be here on that Friday. But I want to be able to have our exa exam cover the nematodes. And I don't know if we'll be able to get through all of the nematodes. But actually, tell you what, we will. We'll have our exam. We'll just stop at whatever, wherever we stop uh, sometime on Wednesday. If we, if we transition, we only have one parasite, we just will say we won't have this on the test, um, on, that, on that test. But yeah, I do want that exam. So that way, when I'm here, you can just take it. All right? So we'll still keep the test on that Friday. It just might not have everything that, that I want on it. Will that mean, since we won't get to acanthocephalins, does that mean the acanthocephalins will be on the lab? No, we'll, we'll have the acanthocephalins on the final lab exam. So it'll just be nematodes on, on this section. I think the one acanthocephalin, I think somebody is presenting it as a species. So that'll be on there, but like the, the actual slides of the acanthocephalins. All right. It's, it's call quits. You uh, enjoy break. If you travel, be safe. If you're not traveling, hopefully you relax. And if you're not traveling or traveling and working 